Hi, um, so my product is called the Raindrop Cake and it's essentially a Asian jelly dessert. Um, jelly desserts are quite popular in Asia, um, especially made out of agar. Agar is a, a gelatin substitute made out of seaweed. Um, it's known in the US, but it's mainly sold in like health food stores and people mainly encounter that in like petri dishes. Um, so it's a little weird for people in the US, but also like the jelly consistency is um, is not like a texture of food that is is uh, that the American palate likes. Um, so you know, as a as a jelly dessert, I think um, this specific jelly dessert was something I saw in Japan, um, and it was inspired by something called a mizu sinjin mochi. So if you ever had a mochi, it's made right out of like rice cake. It's kind of like squishy and chewy, and it's topped with roasted soybean and some sh sugar syrup on top. Uh, so this, um, I read, was uh, created by somebody who wanted to make a water mochi. And so it was something I saw uh, online and I was fascinated by it. By it. Um, and when I saw it, it just looked so cool to me. It reminded me of like a bug's life, like eating a water droplet. Um, it was visually very, very cool. And, and then it just left my mind after for a year. And a year later, it just like popped in my mind randomly. And I was like, I wonder, you know, it's got to have come to the U.S. by now. You know, I'm going to look up to see where I can go and try that. And I looked up, like, didn't, didn't, really, didn't really go anywhere. It didn't really take off. And I was like, well, you know, I'm going to start to try to make this at home. Mm. And that's sort of how it started. So there's not really competition in the U.S.? Um, now there is. Like, after, this is the third year that I've been going. And because I think I got so much uh, media when I launched, um, there are a lot of people who are like creating versions of this. So the one thing I learned about food is you can't copyright a recipe. Um, so this the re this specific recipe I developed myself, but like anybody can make a pizza. Um, so this happened with the Cronut, um, uh, Dominic Anso, like when he created Cronut, you know, he you know tried to you know there was a lot of copycats, then Cronut started show showing up everywhere. Um, so what you can actually protect yourself for um, as a food creator is the trademark on the name. And so that's what I have. So Raindrop Cake is my trademark. Um, and that's the thing that I've sort of like created that's wholly mine. Um, but, you know, I think because it got so popular so quickly, a lot of people just take, took my Raindrop Cake name and started using that as, as well. So that's one of the things that was challenging um, that I also had to like learn to deal with. So, you're not actually selling the cake, you're selling a kit, right? Both. Is, is, how does it travel, right? It's, it's almost, for people who haven't seen it, it's really like, gel, like a jelly-like substance. It's like a big lens almost to mm -hmm. look at, right? Mm -hmm. But it's very watery. Yeah. So, you know, for me, that was part of the appeal of the raindrop cake, was that I was making a really, really fragile dessert. I don't, you know, so that sounds really, like, really cool, but as a producer of it and trying to sell it, it's a nightmare to make, uh, store, and transport. And so the first place that I've sold it, um, I launched at Smorgasburg in New York, which is one of the biggest food, weekend food festivals, I think, anywhere I've seen. And in the, the first day that I sold it, I made about 900 of them. And I think it took me two months to develop this, um, my recipe, my product, but it wasn't just about coming up with the recipe of how to make the raindrop cake and the toppings and the flavoring and all that stuff. The other um, development that I did was how do I make a whole bunch of these? How do I store a whole bunch of these? And how do I transport a whole bunch of these? And I think that's what allowed me to, to um, create and sell um, like thousands of these on, on a weekend. And I, I haven't seen anybody else do it yet because um, the other places where I've seen like try to create another version of raindrop cakes are people with restaurants. People, you know, right. Japanese restaurants, dessert places. And it makes sense for them because they can just make a couple and sell it out, you know, of their kitchen. Um, but like to, in order to make thousands of them, in, in, which is what I was doing in, in a matter of like hours, and then be able to like store them so that they stay cold and they don't um, break with movement because they are very fra very fragile. So they do have to stay cold to keep that consistency yeah, or they, they turn to liquid again? Yeah, the things that I had to like uh, innovate for was how do I keep it cold? How do I keep it from evaporating? How do I keep it from breaking? Um, so that's so I found a way to do that. 
um, with a little bunch of trial and error. Now, what about, um, so, well, I guess for the cake as well as the product, are you working with a co-packer? Are you making everything yourself now? Because like, this isn't the kind of thing you could go to a co-packer and say, I want to make soup. They don't right. know what this is. Right, yeah, I, you know, I didn't really, like, the idea of a cold packer was very, very appealing to me, um, especially if I can just like teach somebody how to do it and that way I can, you know, get a whole bunch of them made. Um, but yeah, I, as just as a first time food business owner, like I didn't even know who, how to approach food packers. Um, and then what I found out when I did approach them, a lot of them aren't set up for this because they do certain things, whether it's bottling sauces or right. drinks or dried goods. And so they have certain machinery. And then also the other hurdle is they have really, really high minimal. So like a minimum would be like, oh, you know, 50,000, which is way bigger than what I'm the size that I'm at right now. Um, so, you know, my other solution was finding a place like this, which is uh, where we're at is Magic City. It is a, um, uh, what is it? It is a shared kitchen space. Um, so I'm one of many other food vendors that work out of this space um, and you know we all have I come in like on certain days when I was still at Smorgasburg I would um, make all my raindrop cakes on on Wednesday um, to be sold on Saturday and Sunday. So you actually make the cake and keep it chilled for three days yeah. or two days? Yeah and so you know I had a lot of ideas written on you know a list of just on my you know notepad and you know I kind of got tired um, of or just frustrated that you know I'd have like ideas that I think were cool and I some of them I'd get off the ground but never go anywhere um, some of them were just like half started ideas so I really just wanted to um, commit to an idea and um, and just take it all as far as I could go until either it failed or it became or I ran out of like resources and money and so I think that was my motivation to start this was I had given myself like part of the reason I, th I I analyzed myself like part of the reason I thought I didn't take an idea like for it is like I didn't have mm, like resources like you know I didn't want to spend a bunch of money on a half-baked idea you, you know but if I allotted myself a budget then I can spend that money however I want you know no matter how ridiculous it is but once I ran out then that's the end that I did you know this I, I move on to the next idea are you comfortable saying how much you put in as your starting yeah, fund? I um, this project started off I as, as like a five thousand dollar project that's what I was willing to lose and just be like okay that was a fun project on to the next idea um, but that wasn't actually what it cost to start the business I think it cost to start the business, which got me all the way to day one of sales, it was about fifteen thousand dollars. That was all all expenses, all in in terms of like production costs, marketing, um, taking pictures, everything to get me to day one of Smorgasburg um, was fifteen thousand dollars. So it was very very cost effective. So how did you know when when you ran out of that fight, that first five thousand? How did you know it was still worth putting in the next five thousand, or did you just do it? 500 here and 200 there and then it just became yeah you know like um i i think it was less sort of direct in that i think like i gave myself like a five thousand dollar like um budget and i was okay with losing that i was okay um so that freed me up to then do things more like hire like a photographer for you know several hundred dollars which you know i probably wouldn't have done if i wasn't you know actually trying to go as far as possible you know I would have been like is this really worth it is this, you know do I spend this four hundred dollars or should I like save that for something else you know um, but because it was like earmarked for this project I was like no I need pictures I'm a <laughs> photographer and then and that was a really important thing that I did um, you know best four hundred dollars I think I spent on this project yeah so it wasn't like okay I ran out of five thousand like do I continue it was like it was more like that freed me up to have this mind state of like do whatever it takes to right. move to the next step and it, it just allowed me to focus on the problem that was at hand so the, you know the first thing was like all right I, I need to buy all the ingredients to experiment with so I, I bought all that experiment with it all right uh, I needed to you know take some pictures of it so I could show it to people hired a photographer bought all this place settings all right, next next one. I need to build a website, you know, and I paid all the things for that. So there wasn't really an account. And the thing that kept me good was that it was progress. 
like every step was like, okay, here's a problem. Here's how, how I can solve it. And as long as I solved it, I was, I was able to move on to the next problem. I think if I reached a problem that I wasn't able to solve and I kept throwing money at it and eventually ran out of money, I would have, been, I would have stopped. What, what were the biggest problems you, you faced and obviously overcame? Um, so I think the, the, the things that food companies have to deal with in terms of health, um, proper um, handling, you know, getting a food license, getting a sales license, all of that stuff, the red tape stuff where um, it makes it legal for me to operate as a food vendor. Um, that was stuff that I had to like quickly learn. Um, and that was difficult because I can't just wing that. You know, those are, there's rules that I have to follow or I can't be in business. Did someone give you incredible advice along the way that helped you out? Or did you solve this all just sort of, you just hit a stumbling block, overcame it, just were you on your own or was there some great mentor? Um, I didn't have any mentors. Um, I wish I did, but I think part of this was, part of it I didn't have a mentor was because I didn't know I was starting a food business. It started off as like a project that I just wanted to work on at home. Um, coming from an advertising world, a lot of the work that I do is very theoretical. It's like, here's an idea, here's a strategy on a piece of paper. Um, and at the end result isn't very gratifying. So what I wanted to do with this, with Raindrop Kick, was just to make something with my hands that was physical, that somebody else, that I can give to somebody else and they can enjoy it and they can either like it or hate it and that was much more gratifying so to me it was almost like an art project um, you know I didn't wasn't like I didn't I don't have a business plan I didn't have a business plan you know it was very much like I'm gonna this this project is 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 just a fun project I'm just gonna solve one thing after another I didn't really care about whether it was the right most optimal way to do it um, and part of it was just like me solving it, you know, and that was part of the part of the uh, appeal to me. So part of the appeal for me with Raindrop Cake was that I was introducing people to a kind of food that I was familiar with, and a lot of Asian people were familiar with. You know, jelly desserts was something I ate as a kid, so this was not like that different to me. And when Asian people saw this, they like knew what it was, even though it looked like a little different. Um, but a lot of Americans didn't know what this was. They didn't know what agar was. They didn't know what jelly was. Um, and so jelly was, desserts just wasn't really a thing. So this was, it was also like vegan, vegetarian friendly, which is very different than gelatin or jello that people are familiar with here in the U.S. And so the second year in creating a new version or a new product, um, I wanted to do the same thing. Like what sorts of ingredients, flavors can I sort of uh, introduced to people that you know I'm familiar with that I liked um, but maybe the American audience ha aren't as familiar with um, but also very visual pleasing and so I started working with different ingredients what I landed on with the purple raindrop cake was ube which is a purple yam which is um, something that I enjoyed you know um, before um, it's a it's really popular in Filipino cultures. It's just a, like a yam sweet potato that we have, but it's purple, but it has a really different flavor. And it's a natural, very vibrant purple color. And so uh, I created that the second year. I made the purple raindrop cake and was able to get some of the press and all of that. And so for the third year, I didn't want to just say, okay, you know, let's come up with a third version of the raindrop cake. Um, I want to evolve sort of like the business. Um, and the third year, I, I didn't go back to Smorgasburg. So this year, um, it's very sporadic um, because it's, it's seasonal. It is seasonal, uh, but also like now that I shifted over the kits, those numbers are completely different than when I had the, oh, okay. the, the cakes at Smorgasburg. But the, the I didn't really spend a lot of meaty dollars when I was at Smorgasburg. Um, and what I noticed is that um, meaty dollars didn't really help me at Smorgasburg because it's such a local thing and the majority of my sales are going to be from people who are walking by um, or have saw it online and are going to Smorgasburg anyways. So uh, what I did find that it was very consistent, um, at least average doubt, I was getting like 5 to 10% of foot traffic of Smorgasburg um, audience um, and that's how I can sort of like project sales. Uh, I just looked at what's the expected uh, attendance rate.
for that weekend. Hmm. I'm like, all right, I'm going to get that certain percentage of that. Do's and don'ts, out. worst thing to do, best thing to do? Worst things to do, do's and don'ts. Um, oh, you know, yeah, I mean, the other thing that I, I don't know if this is advice, to, I mean, I, I just thought when I started, uh, I had a very frugal approach to starting my business, which allowed me to be profitable within like the first weekend of selling. Like I started of this as a very frugal business, fifteen thousand dollars, and then throughout I've always tried to keep my costs low so that I can keep a healthy profit margin that allowed me to quit my job and, and work on this full time. Now, was that a good thing or a bad thing? You know, I I'm not sure. You know, I could have just like respent every single dollar and just put it back into, you know, and hired like a social media uh, person to create content at the very beginning things might be very different but I wouldn't be able to quit my job if that was the case you know um, so how long ago did you quit your job like were you in two years first, before you quit no the first month like oh after a month of starting I was profitable the first week oh, wow. like I was like oh shoot like you know I sold like a like 900 raindrop cakes the first day um, and yeah and it was just like and I needed a lot more time the first couple, like the first year in terms of producing things. Um, it t used to take me a whole week to make 900 raindrop cakes. And then I got it down to making 900 in like six hours. Uh, yeah, wow. so, you know, my rate, uh, my efficiency really, really like went up um, as I got better at it. Um, so, yeah, being frugal, I think, just starting off, um, you know, really helped me to, you know, what do they say? Like eighty percent of businesses fail the first year. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I wanted to give myself the best shot at making it beyond the first year. Sounds like it worked.